Okay, perfect. And Jubin, did you want to share your screen with the presentation? Um, I don't have it with me. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, I I'll share my screen. Yeah. Oh no no no! It's our presentation. I, I pulled it up. It's our presentation for the introduction to. Oh. Uh, okay, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to be introducing Dr. Kama Galuma. Oh, sorry. Apologies. Rachel, go ahead. All right, sounds good. All right, well, welcome to today's session, everyone. My name is Rachel, and I am the president of Pre-Med CC, a student-led organization established in the fall of 2021. And our goal as an organization was to create an online program for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive positions. We know how challenging finding mentorship can be, especially in the middle of a pandemic. And while we advertise our organization for being for community college students, our events are open to anyone. We realize that finding mentorship and guidance in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation med students people that lack financial resources, or just those that do not know people in the medical field. One of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can do it from the comfort of your own home or from wherever you are. We typically have events on most Fridays from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, and occasionally on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Pacific time. If you aren't able to attend the event, all of our sessions are uploaded on our YouTube channel. Many of our sessions will end with a Q&A with our speakers. Any questions that you have can be put in the Q&A section on Zoom and our team leaders will read them and have them answered at the end of the session. After you have attended our event, you can log into our website and complete the quiz, which will contain questions pertaining to our session today. If you score 70% or higher on the quiz, you will be awarded a certificate to show that you have attended our session today. Students that attend all of our sessions this school year will receive a Pre-Med CC Scholar Award for all the hours of shadowing they have completed. And if you wanna stay connected with our upcoming events or wanna tell your pre-med friends that are struggling to get shadowing hours about our organization, all of our social media accounts are at Pre-Med CC. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Madeline, to introduce our speaker today. Thanks, Rachel. Hello, everyone. Today, we are honored to host Dr. Kama Galuma. Dr. Galumas currently serves as the Associate Dean for Admissions and Student Affairs at UC San Diego School of Medicine, where he oversees the offices of admissions, student affairs, and financial aid. Dr. Galuma obtained his undergraduate degree from Oberlin College in Ohio, his medical degree from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, and then completed an emergency re medicine residency at the University of Michigan. He joined the UCSD Department of Emergency Medicine as faculty member in 2001 and also serves as a professor of an emergency medicine. Dr. Galuma has received numerous awards, such as the Medical Student Teaching Award in the UCSD Department of Emergency Medicine and the Faculty Mentorship Award from the UCSD Graduate Student Association. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Galuma. Thank you very much, Madeline and Rachel. And I, I want to extend the appreciation to you and Jubin and the whole organization for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, so do you want me to just go ahead and share my slides and we'll start? Go for it. Okay. Right, let's see here. Um, can you see that okay? Just want to check. Okay. Well, um, I view this as a great opportunity to talk to you all today, and I look forward to the questions. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, community college and the UC, UC San Diego School of Medicine. And my talk will be uh, organized in three parts. Uh, one is talking about our our connection with community colleges here at the UC San Diego School of Medicine and sort of pipeline programs, what we're doing, what the future holds. The next portion of the talk will be sort of an outline of applying to med school. I won't get into details, the exact timelines and things like that, just the broad concepts. And in that, we'll really go into sort of what I think admissions committees look for and talking to my fellow admissions deans from around the country, definitely here in the UC system because I talk to them a lot, um, but just uh, uh, meetings and so on and so forth. Um, and so it's definitely what we uh, in the admissions committee here at UC San Diego look for as well, vis-a-vis -vis how you might present yourself as an applicant. And then I'll close the talk with um, common myths. We'll dispel some common myths um, uh, you know, I was talking to Juven and other staff uh, earlier, how Reddit is really 
a, a source of misinformation. Um, some of it may be good inf information as well, and no doubt, but there's a lot of misinformation and just do our best to dispel any myth that may be out there in the form of questions that have come up frequently at these talks, and I'll try and get at them. And also questions that have come up in prior talks I've given to, to applicants and, and undergraduate students. So first, let's talk about uh, community colleges and the UC San Diego School of Medicine. Um, and, and as I talk about this part of the talk, I really have to give credit to uh, especially one individual. There's so many amazing people at UCSD, really, and there's a long history of involvement with community colleges. But, uh, you know, colleague and an and addition to our School of Medicine, Ramon Hernandez. Um, he is the project director for our Health Career Opportunities Program, or HCOP, here at UC San Diego School of Medicine. He's also the project um, director for the Hispanic Center of Excellence that we have here at the uh, University and the School of Medicine. He's a very, very prominent figure in California medicine, and I'll go into what that is uh, in a second, and an instrumental figure in our ULMSP program, uh, which I'll also describe starting now. Um, so, you know, I just want to kind of outline a sort of uh, from the, the UC San Diego perspective, our pipelines and our interactions um, with our community. If you look at, we really share a partnership with other the uh, support structures and programs that, are, that help community college students and, and high school students for that matter here in San Diego. This includes HCOP, HCOE, San Diego State University, California, AHEC. Um, and we have several programs that uh, we are directly involved in. Uh, from high school, we have the Research Methodology Training Laboratory. Um, but as you can see, SDSU also helps out and, and does amazing things. And, and AHEC has a camp script. So. Uh, at uh, UCSD, we have the University Link Medical Science Program, and this is where you as community college students may really get involved. I've given lectures at this program. Uh, we call I just call it University Link. Um, that is a very prominent uh, program we have here uh, uh, in, in terms of pipeline and helping and mentoring community college students who are looking to transfer, and I'll get into that in a second. We also have a research methodology training laboratory. We have a project Puma, which uh, mentors undergrads uh, applying to medicine more in the closure that last, last year tour or two of college where you're getting ready to apply. That's where Puma comes in. We also have our, our uh, Student National Medical Association mentoring for the African-American students uh, specifically uh, that we do at, at the undergraduate and, and medical school level. post -bac, uh meaning you've graduated from college already, we have a conditional acceptance program here at UCSD. Um, there's a pre-matriculation program there's even a postback program in, at UCSD that we uh, that a lot of our admissions committee members and faculty actually are advisors for, and that's really great. And it's a very strong program that we respect a lot in the admissions committee because we see what postback programs uh, of students who come to our med school do. And then in the health professions realm, uh, once you get into med school, we have the UCSD Hispanic Center of Excellence, and uh, we have also um, the Prime Health Equity Program and the HCOE, Hispanic Centers of Excellence Student and Faculty Scholars uh, Program. So it gets it's a continuum of involvement from high school uh, to the health profession school uh, here in, um, in San Diego. And I mentioned the University Link Medical Science Program. Um, that's something I've personally enjoyed lecturing at. Um, uh, it's uh, what it is, it's, it's been running since 2001 uh, and it's a, um, uh, uh, a summer and residential program and year-long advising program, uh, academic enrichment program. Um, and it's uh, takes in students um, who intend to pursue one of four fields in, in healthcare, medicine, uh, dentistry, pharmacy, and veterinary medicine. Um, and it uh, specifically targets transfer students from region X community colleges in, in our Southern California area. Uh, then we're involved with all nine community colleges in the San Diego and Imperial counties uh, in California. What this program does, it's a longitudinal program beginning with a four-year residential program uh, and then continues through undergrad and in the application year to medical school and to professional school. So it's really comprehensive, as you can see here, with different modalities as, as our uh, students in this program move uh, forward. Um, first from learning community, social identity, and all the way at the end, uh, applying and getting to med schools, portfolio development, uh, and peer-to-peer -peer counseling and mentoring. Pretty comprehensive. You know, we've had to uh, have this program virtually because of the pandemic, obviously. These are just the screenshots that Dr. Hernandez took um, uh, at the conclusion of each of the past years we've done. 
um, again, a wonderful program. We're looking forward to doing it in person um, uh, in, the 20, in the summer of 2022, assuming the Omicron uh, variant uh, gives us pause. Oh, and I can see one of our incoming med students in that uh, panel of pictures. I won't identify him because of his privacy, but um, uh, I just realized he was in that photo. Um, but here's Dr. Hernandez. I'll circle his face because uh, he don't, uh, I, I don't have to worry about his privacy. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, great ally, school of medicine. Now, um, who are our university link students? Well, 54% um, of them are female. 65% um, of first generation. So uh, that, that makes us feel like we're really doing something. Uh, look at 65% first gen college students, 41% Hispanic. Again, again, making us feel like we're really doing things, but a good diversity. 21% are white, non Hispanic, Latino, 25% Asian, 9% uh, Black, African American. 100% um, of our link students are from economically, educationally, or environmentally disadvantaged backgrounds. Where did they transfer from? Well, as you can see there in the, the, the photo on the, on the right, uh, all around San Diego, uh, Mesa College, Claremont, uh, uh, sorry, Grossmont College, uh, Cuyamaca, Palomar, uh, just around the region. Uh, uh, Southwestern College, that's down in Chula Vista in, in, in South San Diego County, uh, just all over the place, as you can see. Yeah, uh, and uh, this program is going on since 2001. 165 students have participated in our LINK program. 89% obtained a bachelor's degree. That is success. 90% obtained a degree in biomedical sciences. Again, they're really closing the loop on this. 65% have enrolled in professional or graduate school. And that's perhaps, uh, you know, the 98% transferred to four year university and the 65% enrolled in, in professional graduate school. That to me is just really impressive. Um, and the students say great things about this program, uh, as you can see from the testimonials on, on the right there. Um, just a lot of great things. Now I want to transition while we're talking about community college to another domain that uh, we're taking from evidence based to scaling and sustainability. Talk about the California Medicine Scholars Program. And again, Dr. Um, Hernandez is a key figure in this in the state. Um, um, so, um, you know. The California Medicine Coalition was established in 2016 um, specifically to address the lack of diversity in the California physician workforce. Uh, it's part of a multi-year uh, collaborative effort with California stakeholders. Um, and it's based on the best practices of the LINK program I just told you about. Uh, so it's really, this is a, a scaling kind of model that's working really well. Uh, so the coalition developed uh, California Medicine as a systemic intervention to address the chronic crisis of physician diversity. The Synergy program in this is, uh, is the California Medicine Scholars Program. Um, uh, it's a system-wide collaborative pathway that supports increased numbers of underrepresented minority physicians and efforts to address physician shortage in under-resourced areas. Uh, the coalition consists of over 200 professionals and leaders from across the state's medical schools involved in there. Um, and it also involves the uh, medical schools, community college, the CSU California State, um, uh, university system, University of California system, regional health care workforce pathway programs, students, government officials, physicians, healthcare leaders, uh, pretty impressive. Now, the SB 40 um, just got uh, signed by the governor. In 2021, the governor of California signed into the California state budget uh, pilot three-year uh, funding to establish um, four California medicine regional hubs uh, of healthcare opportunity. Um, Senator uh, Melissa Ortago um, was the, the prime real the sponsor of this and the author of the bill. Uh, and she was from Central Valley, just instrumental in getting this uh, across the finish line uh, and getting funded. Again, three year pilot, four regional hubs, at least one hub is in the Central Valley where Senator Ortago is from. Uh, it's uh, going to promote students giving back to their local communities, it's going to engage in cross sector institutions and agencies in a region and support and track institutional transfer rates for underrepresented students uh, uh, in, in this um, realm. It sort of looks like this. Each hub will have uh, three community colleges associated with it, one or two undergraduate institutions with it, one medical school with it, um, and then three community partners and health centers. Um, and a competitive request for application for this uh, 
uh, to select and implement the four hubs was released March 1st of this year. Uh, and the hubs are expect expected to begin in the fall of 2022. So just this fall, really. Um, and uh, you can go to the website there in the slide. Uh, but if you just uh, go, uh, just put California Medicine, uh, and you'll, you'll find it very easily, just to find more information about that. And you as students can apply to be members of this in, in this program as well. So here are the QR codes. Uh, if you, I don't know if you can see them clearly, um, I can put the links in the chat after the talk um, um, to apply to University Link. Uh, that's through UCSD, and also to be a California Medicine Scholar uh, starting in 2022. So just these two QR codes will get you um, where you want. But again, I'll put the links directly to the each uh, later in the chat uh, when we end here. Okay, next. I want to go to the next phase of the talk, uh, which is um, how our med school, the UC San Diego School of Medicine, looks at applicants. And I frame this to say that it's going to be very similar. Um, and I'll tell you where differences between different medical schools may lie. But it's going to be very similar to across the country, definitely in the state. <laughs> uh, uh, very similar because uh, I talk to other deans and I know other schools in the state for sure, in addition to across, across the country. So here at UCSD, it's, I have to be honest with you, it's a tough, but you already know this, right? We get, uh, for example, this year we got around 8,500 applications. Last year we got 9,000. Uh, it went up with COVID. Uh, this year settled down a little bit. Usually we got 7,500 or about, uh, but it's a lot of applications. And from those, uh, we sent out 4,000, about 4,500 secondary applications. And from those, about 800 are inter sent, invited to interview at our school. And uh, it's to fill a class of now 140. We just went up uh, from 134 to 140. Um, so it's uh, very competitive. But I'm hoping that at the end of this talk, I can give you some concepts and some perspectives that will help you position yourself uh, uh, to apply strongly. Now, speaking of that, uh, let me outline uh, really the two, just to break it down to the essentials that in most basic terms, med schools, and I think across the country, really, they're looking at us, when they look at you as an applicant, they're looking for two things, really. They're asking the question, will she or he or they be a good medical student? Now, what does that mean? It means um, you're gonna get a lot of information and learning from that highly complex, but not only that, you have to be able to interact in a group because it's very interdisciplinary and, and the group learning, you have to function in a team, communicate with peers, be a good communicator, you have to be a good person, because that's part of your learning. It's not just sitting on looking at a lecture and taking a test, multiple choice test. Med school is very different um, than maybe college was. So to be a good med student is that good communicator, someone who can handle the rigor of the uh, curriculum, um, and so on and so forth. They also ask, will this, will he or she or they be a good doctor? Um, they're in uh, sort of similar things, uh, intellectual, scholarly, um, but especially a good communicator, um, a good good a sense of, of ethics, the, all these things, just the, what, what it takes to be a good doctor. Are they resilient? Uh, is there grit? Do they have perspective? You know, things like that. So they do look at your academic readiness. Uh, the GP and MCAT are primarily there just to make sure that you can handle the, the curriculum for the most part, even though you ask any faculty member worth their salt, any admissions thing worth their salt and say, is there a clear correlation between the height of the GPA and how good a doctor anybody is? Not too much of a correlation. Is there any correlation between how high your MCAT score is and how good of a doctor, how much your patients will love you, how much your nurses will enjoy working with you, how, how good care you give your patients? Not exactly. Uh, there, there's definitely some distance there. Um, it, it is an indicator of certain things that will enable you to apply yourself in different directions, no doubt, but it's not a primary indicator. But they do look at your academic readiness. They also look at your extracurricular, creative, and scholarly activities, um, meaningful exposure to the medical profession, evidence of commitment to service, your, your leadership, artistic endeavors, athletics. Uh, this is the whole youth. And they also look at your communication and collaboration skills. Um, and they find that sort of the support of your faculty and other supervisors. Now, I'll go into letters in a second here. And also, when you interview, they're really getting at uh, how you communicate, but also your perspective. And, and I'll get to that in a second. It's a little more complicated than, than, than it seems, but also a little more straightforward. It makes sense once I highlight this for you. So one thing I didn't mention is not all med schools are the same, um, depending even on the state of California. Some med schools are new and they're oriented towards primary care. Others med schools have been around for decades. 
and they're, they're into research, um, but not just research, you know. Um, and every med school has a separate vision and mission based on their locality, the makeup of their faculty, their position in the state, where they are, the region, uh, even the country, even the world. Um, and so they apply that vision and mission uh, in their admissions process. Um, so I just want to tell you a bit about our vision. What we did at UCSD uh, very recently, in fact, in the past few months, actually, is we, we really stepped back and said, OK, let's talk to ourselves. And we surveyed students, staff, faculty, deans, chairs, just uh, patients. We surveyed uh, a whole lot of people to find out our, our why and who we are. So our vision, when you start talking to people, really getting into the, the, the into things, this is our vision. So the vision at the UC San Diego School of Medicine is training for tomorrow, rooted in science and justice, delivered with your heart. Very straightforward. It, it, you know, it's train, every school needs a mission. So it's training for tomorrow, which means we're looking to not just today, but we're going to where will our doctors need to be, where will our patients want to be uh, tomorrow. And we we are scientists. We, we have a strong science background at UCSD. This is rooted in science. We also have a strong sense of justice. It's no surprise that we are one of the first founders of the free clinic system uh, in the country. It's no surprise that one of our academic tracks is about health equity or, or spreading equity between patient populations. So justice is in there. It came up almost right to the top immediately. And deliver with heart. Uh, they're good people here at UCSD. And we realize that's what we do. We, we, we use compassion and whatnot. So our mission, and that's where we will look at, at any applicants coming in is to educate and inspire physicians to provide innovative, compassionate, equitable care to advance the health of patients, families, and communities. Um, so when we're looking at your, your folder, your file, uh, that's the lens through which we'll, we'll look through. Um, you know, we want to inspire physicians to provide innovative, compassionate, equitable care uh, and advance the health of patients, their families, uh, and communities. So it's not just individual patients, it's looking at the community perspective. Um, yeah, so that's our mission. And then we also have core values. Uh, these are they right here. We're compassionate, person-centered, meaning thinking about not only individual students and who they are as individuals and catering to their individual growth, but our staff, our patients, our outlook of the patient, that they're, they're human-centered, person-centered. We're also equitable and just, creative and innovative, scientifically informed and collaborative. And so as you, um, as you uh, look at schools you're applying to, try and get a sense of their mission, uh, but also think about yourself uh, in terms of how you might fit into the mission of, of a school you're applying to. We're probably not the only ones of this kind of mission. It's it's no surprise that the other missions and, and values that are very similar, that's a good thing. Uh, this is not the game to be unique by any stretch. It's the game to be meaningful. And so you'll find these same values in many, many, many other med schools. In fact, if you don't, I would question the, the med school itself. Uh, Okay, let's talk about the process. Uh, and I'm gonna build out the process so you familiarize just the broad strokes. I will not talk about deadlines and dates because they're different, they change year to year, and they're definitely different from school to school. And plus, I will not be accurate. Uh, I operate at a, a more strategic or conceptual level. I will defer to individual websites for information. So when you look at it, uh, the process of applying to UCSD and practically every other med school in the country is you put in a primary application, they look at it, and they invite you to submit a secondary application. They look at it some more, this additional information, and then they invite you for an interview if they want to, right? And then you have interviews at UC, UCSD, we do multiple mini uh, 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 interviews, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, we do that, and then uh, I put everything together, an admissions committee looks at things and, and makes a decision. Yes, wait list, or no, we can't give you a spot right now. Uh, and that's, the essentials of that. The primary application is where you'll be submitting your MCAT score, your transcripts, your demographic information. This is largely through MCAS, it's the WMC service. You'll be submitting your experiences, your personal statement. Um, and these will go to practically every med school, it's the same. Um, and then here at UCSD, varies common to other med schools, definitely all the ones that I know of, I've never heard of med school any different. They'll choose who to send, uh, invite a secondary application for and then you submit a secondary application. And these are school specific. Now you start to get differences in school because they're doing, this is mission driven, right? Um, so UCSD's uh, secondary application has, they want, we want to know more about you. So we have an autobiographical sketch we ask of you. We want to find out about your family. We do, and I'll tell you why in a second. We want to find out 
your family income, your education, your parents, things like that. And because we use holistic review, um, we also have several academic tracks. As you can see, our, our Prime Health Equity track, Prime Tide, um, the American Indian Health, uh, Global uh, Global Health, uh, MD PhD. So we need statements of interest into why you want to think about these tracks uh, if you're interested in them. And of course, we ask for your letters of recommendation. It could be from faculty, research mentors, community service mentors, coaches, you've had them from coaches, healthcare professionals with whom you've worked. Um, so that's your secondary. Now, we review your application and it occurs in context. We look at your academic accomplishments. We look for trends over time. Uh, a lot of questions I get, hey, do you, uh, if your grades are going up, does that count? You bet it counts. Uh, in fact, uh, we'll look at your last two years. If we see a trend going upwards, we may downplay the first two years. And because, you know, you can have a low GPA, but if you're going upwards, we look at the last two years, oh, this person's performing at a, solid level in the last two years we're, that's their real that's what they're telling us we're not going to look at the gp we're going to look at the, those last two years we look at the rigor of coursework you take too we actually do look at them and of course we look at your extracurricular activities and service activities level of commitment uh leadership innovation and we look at your work activities some of you have to work that factors uh, in a major way we understand that people have to work to pay bills and support themselves all these are examined in the context of your background. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by your background? Again, we do holistic review. We take pride in doing holistic review here at the UC San Diego School of Medicine. Uh, we're not the only med school that does it. In fact, but in fact, it's very common. In fact, I think a med school that doesn't do holistic review is falling short in my personal opinion. Um, we look at the, your, your family income, education, expectations of your family. Some families don't expect their their students to go to to med school i've seen personal statements where um i remember reading one where uh, this person came from a conservative immigrant family and they thought her becoming a doctor would affect her chance to get married so you can imagine that kind of downward pressure on her right so we look at the expectations we also look if you're if you're every person in your family is a doctor <laughs> and suddenly you're applying to med hmm, why is this person applying to med school is it is it a really heartfelt desire or are they keep, keeping up with the family? So we look at expectations, both downward pressures and upward pressures and put that into context. We look at uh, the secondary education um, uh, you've had and you've, definitely your parents have had, whether they've had a secondary education. We look at ongoing family and personal circumstances um, affecting your academic performance. You have this uh, animation there, someone perpetually just climbing upwards with all its load on its back. Um, we, we can we try and feel that out uh, whether that's been your path uh, and we recognize that and identify it whenever we can did you need to work to pay for, for college during college education maybe that's why you don't have a whole lot of activities because you're working two jobs we see that that's factored in uh, uh, no uh, admissions committee member worth their salt will say ah they didn't really have a good portfolio um they're working but they didn't have no we'll say we often the refrain you here at our admissions committee is yeah, I don't see much in terms of uh, extracurriculars or leadership and whatnot, but I also see this person working two jobs just to make ends meet. Ah, and that factors in there. We put it into context. We also look at whether English was your first language and whether it could affect your MCAT and your CARS, the CARS aspect of your MCAT score, all factored in. We look at cultural barriers to academic success. We'll talk about your personal statement of autobiography. Um, why do we look at those? At UCSD, we look at both very carefully. Why? We're not trying to trip you up. We just want to find out who you are. We want to try and figure out what you'd bring to a medical school. We want to find out what you'd bring to medicine itself. Um, you know, uh, you'll notice, at least I've noticed and my committee's noticed at uh, UCSD, uh, that you have archetypes of people. Um, in terms of students and how they're passionate about it. You wanna be, and I say, think about the above and stay true to who you are, because if you're true to who you are, you will manifest in a certain archetype. If you're an accomplished person, you will manifest in a certain way. So some people manifest as a servant leader. These are the kind of people in their, even in, in their activities, they're, maybe they founded a, a nonprofit to help the homeless in their town or a, a, a mentoring program in their, in a high school. Or they're just out there or in community, in a free clinic, they, they just really got out there and did something. Servant leader type of things. So they took an initiative. 
where they founded things. Maybe they did the thing in their college too. It doesn't have to be outside. So they did something for their university uh, or people, a certain group of students in university, they found an organization, they led an organization, they worked really hard to take care of others, the servant leader. And then there's an innovator archetype. Um, these are people, sometimes at UCSD will see they start, started a startup uh, and, and have a patent or two. But it's not just that. These are maybe amazing researchers and they're, they publish, they do things. But it doesn't have to be even researcher or scientific. It can be you create things. Um, so you see how they, they overlap with a certain leader, right? You could create new programs, just this innovator who's thinking and inventing. And it could be inventing ways people work. It can be science, it could be social studies, and social and public health. It, it, they're just an innovator. They just think outside the box. Um, I remember once I read an application, uh, we actually all reviewed it in the admissions committee of someone who had been a chef. She was in New York City. She'd been a, a professional chef. And I don't know, she just started volunteering and, and she changed her career completely. Uh, but she knew food and she parlayed that into uh, healthy choices for underserved populations in New York City and innovative in how she did that, knowing what she knew about food and being a chef uh, uh, and a highly trained chef too, to uh, the food choices for people. It, but the way she did it was very innovative. So that's what I mean. And then there's a healer archetype. This is someone who just rolls up their sleeve and just takes care of patients. They volunteer. Um, I remember once reading an application of someone, uh, she had a full-time job. That she was in a gap year. A lot of her students take a gap year. A whole bunch of them take gap years, right? But she had a gap year. She had a full-time job in San Francisco um, doing what, paying the bills. And, um, and on the weekends, she went and volunteered in the free clinic, the suitcase clinic in Berkeley. She just take the, the train across and spend her Saturday, maybe Sundays, I don't know, but every Saturday she did that. She actually didn't mention that in her letter, but one of her letter writers wrote it. I mean, because she, she wasn't being a boastful, hey, I'm working six days a week. I'm so passionate. I, you know, she didn't actually bring it up. You just see in her activity, she didn't, one of her letters said, oh my God, this person's amazing. They work a six day, a five day work week. And then on Saturday, they come and just roll up their sleeves and they're helping with the patients here. That is the healer archetype, someone who takes care of people uh, on an individual level and is just wants to be a doctor at the bedside, laying the hands, make, making people feel comfortable. So, and these archetypes come up again and again, and, and they and each of you applying may have different modalities. It's not like exclusively, you don't want to be one-sided, but you'll have a strength you parlay. Um, and so think about yourself, what you love, what you like to do, and uh, don't try and squeeze yourself into other segments and, and build up other things. Uh, show who you are when you're applying and uh, people, good admissions committees will see that. Questions you do not want to leave admissions committee asking. And I like to do this, I give you advice based on real stuff. <laughs> uh, the questions my admissions committee literally asked. Why does this applicant want to be a doctor? Um, shockingly, some people and I, I want to give you advice when you write your personal statement. You want to actually say why you want to be a doctor. Some people make the mistake of writing their personal statement, just paraphrasing what they've seen, but they never say why they want to be a doctor. And that's a grave mistake um, to make. Uh, literally, we've seen it, multiple personal statements like that. And I went and I saw uh, uh, this person with pneumonia. Then I went over here and I and I did a service trip to Guatemala and I saw this. Then I helped a homeless in a homeless clinic and I, I saw this. And then maybe a sentence, I want to be a doctor. Why do you want to be a doctor? Uh, so make sure you articulate that in your personal statement. This um, is for people who have a lot of research. Um, and we've had applicants with 10 publications. They're still not even interviewed at our program because that's all they do. I literally had a conversation with a faculty member the other day about how their student who in the lab, multiple publications, high ranking journals, why? Because you don't, it's, this is med school people. So um, if you think uh, get all these publications and, and not kind of round things out uh, to who you are, um, you will look like a PhD applicant. And that's what you never want an admissions committee saying, why does an applicant just apply to an PhD program? I've heard that multiple times in admissions committee meetings. So if you are an applicant with a really strong research background, that's good. You, you're the innovator archetype but you want to think holistically. Why am I taking this research to the bedside? Why am I want to be a doctor as opposed to a PhD? And you want to articulate that in your personal statement and, and even your activities you choose. You actually want to walk the walk and just not talk the talk. So even the activities you choose, let me get out there with patients and, and people and, and apply myself in some way. 
other thing, um, some of you may have already been, maybe you have other careers and you're going back to community college to, to redirect. And why really is this applicant changing the career path? Uh, we've seen that. And um, so you have to articulate why you're switching from one thing to another. And especially if you already have a career path in nursing, if you're already at the bedside taking care of patients. So for you who are uh, maybe CNAs or even have a nursing background or been taking care of patients in nursing, why do you want to be a doctor? Why do you want to pivot away from being a nursing? Make sure you articulate that in your personal statement. That's more of a personal statement thing. Letters of recommendation. So good letters um, um, articulate um, you know, how well you did in a class or a project on a team, how much you did in the class and a project or a team. But the best letters of recommendation also describe, uh, again, we wanna find out who you are, your drive to help others, your drive to overcome barriers, your passion, your compassion, your ethics, um, your good character and how you treat others, how you stand out from others in a good way. I saw one, uh, one letter, <laughs> Um, actually, I've seen two where, where the, the applicants stood out in a bad way. They had no insight. And the letter writer just wrote what they wrote. They wrote good things, but they also wrote, well, they noticed something else about this person. Uh, and so you, you want to make sure your letters show how you stand out in a good way. I'm oh, sorry, my presentation is frozen here. Now, uh, after a secondary screening, you may be invited for interviews. Um, uh, most medical schools now are doing the multiple mini interviews. What are they? Well, you show up. We actually do it virtually now, and I get to that in a second. But in the old days, as this photo would suggest, you show up in your suit at the med school, and you stand outside the door, and they say, you have two minutes to read the prompt, and you get a prompt that's out of nowhere. You have no idea where it's coming from. Um, and then uh, it'll tell you something like, you're here, and you find this. What do you do? And you have to think about your answer. You have two minutes to think about your answer, at least at UCSD, that's how we do it. Uh, variable amount of times. And then you go into the door when it's time and there's somebody sitting there. Um, at UCSD, it's a person who knows, the, knows the, the, the MMI really well. They do not know you. They're just judging you on your judgment, and who you are and whatnot. They don't know which school you went to, all the accomplishments, they know nothing about you. And then you have eight minutes to answer the prompt and the person's listening to you. They may ask some follow-up questions and these prompts have a rubric uh, that designed to assess certain things. And eight minutes, the, the, the announcement step that you step out and you go to the next room. We do it now uh, by Zoom in the virtual round, same exact thing, okay? Now, the MMIs, um, <laughs> they're really assessing personal domains. Um, some med schools do do a traditional interview. Uh, in most people's opinion, traditional interviews are fraught with uh, problems, bias. If, if, if you, the person kind of likes you, they, they ask you things or you have a common interest with the interviewer, you, you strike a conversation, you have the chemistry, it's all about chemistry, and it can really go both ways. It can, it can uh, bias you favorably or can bias you unfavorably if they have nothing in common with you. And especially from students from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, you know, medicine, unfortunately, uh, it's not a good representation from, from underrepresented people. So your, your average interviewer is going to not be underrepresented in medicine. They may not have the same background as those of you who are from underrepresented backgrounds. They may have not come from a disadvantaged background themselves. Uh, they may have a totally different set of hobbies than you ever could dream of, you know. Um, and you're, you're just not going to hit a, the same hobby, you know. It's like, Oh my God, you like horse riding? Me too. I grew up horse riding. You're not going to get that. <laughs> uh, yeah, you may not get that um, a lot. For those of you who like horse riding, it's a great hobby, by the way. Uh, I'm just saying. But, um, but the MMIs, we feel, are much more robust in their ability to assess the domains we care about, at least at UCSD. Uh, all our sister institutions uh, tend to use them uh, to very extents. Um, and uh, they tend to test domains that matter to being a doctor. And it goes to a good med student. It's just a good person, right? your judgment, your maturity, self-insight, empathy, perspective taking, your awareness of things. Um, and each of those scenarios are built a little differently and they are checking these domains. Um, and, and that's how it goes. So as I close here, by the time you interview, uh, the committee kind of looks over everything one more time. They literally, at our school, we go back to the whole thing, look at everything again uh, from start to finish and then make a decision, um, uh, as I was saying. The advice is be early on time for all actions. Treat every contact with the medical school, meaning its students, its staff, faculty, administrators, as you would treat a formal interview. Just 
be professional at all times. Also, uh, I've been shocked how many people have grammatical mistakes, grammatical mistakes or typos in their their uh, their in their personal statement, their autobio or descriptions. Please, please double check that. Um, people get worried when people are not detail oriented and not attentive. This is the most important application of your life. If you really want to be a doctor as much as I did when I was applying, right? And so uh, the fact you didn't check the spelling uh, tells a committee a lot about you. It's like, hmm, this person's kind of kind of casual. They just kind of, they're a little casual. They just, uh, what do they do with a patient? I don't know. What if they're in school and they do that? This could be problematic. This, uh, we could still love them as a doctor, but boy, we'd have to do a lot of work to get them from point A to point B, and that will register on admissions committees. Okay, the last part of the talk is sorting out fact from fiction. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna do is go through some scenarios and things. I've already covered some things um, based on questions I've gotten when I've talked to other undergrad um, groups um, and also uh, questions that Juven sent uh, uh, for this talk of uh, questions that have come up from you in the past or your peers in the past. So before I start though, I just wanna say, please use trusted source of information advice, like the WMC Aspiring Docs website. Um, go there, look at it. Uh, also look at the uh, um, MSAR, there's a link to that in there, WMC Medical School Admission Requirements website, where you can really compare med schools. Look in there, you'll see what schools are saying. This is what we care about, this is what we do. Um, if you have college pre-health advisors and they, uh, they're they good to go to as well, I admit in community college, you probably won't have as much access to that. That's why I'm going to all this detail. And I love this meeting. I get to talk to you. Uh, college pre-med, pre-health uh, advisors at UCC have me come talk to their students too. So I'm giving you even more expanded talk because uh, it's a privilege to be able to do that. Um, um, but when you do, if you do transfer into a four-year college, definitely go to them. Why are they uh, important? They, they know the lay of the land too. But they also know their college students and how they do, right? That's very important. So that's very good to talk to college pre-health advisors. You want to avoid hearsay. Um, uh, avoid anonymous websites. Uh, like Reddit's nice. I like Reddit's good in some ways, but I've seen so much misinformation on there. It's not Reddit's fault. It's the people who are typing into it, right? So watch out for those kind of websites. I've, I've been shocked. We always are shocked about how much misinformation is in there. And uh, it's shocking. Um, uh, also avoid blogs. There are certain blogs and I've seen growth of them now. Um, hey, we, we have admissions experience. Uh, and these are people, they're actually prior med students for that matter. Now it looks very convincing, right? Think about it. A prior med student uh, now has an MD, they're in residency. They have say they've had admissions committee experience, faculty, be wary of that. Um, I, I've known individuals who actually have been posted their profiles to these things I know they are, and no, you've not had admissions committee um, experience based on what I know. Maybe you helped interview, uh, but you have not done a deep dive uh, that the way the admissions committee has of a whole lot of files. So be wary of files, the blogs, and other things. People purport to know what they're doing, even uh, even if they're MDs. Sometimes you have to be careful. Um, uh, and speaking about MDs, the last thing is avoid well-meaning people who'd rather give you bad advice than no advice. I like to do work around my house. I like to go to Home Depot sometimes and do repairs. I always know to ask advice. Um, and I look for maybe the gray haired individual uh, in, the, in the plumbing section and try to ask, well, I just ask advice. Why? More often than not, they're retired plumbers and they know what they're doing. But sometimes I'll get someone relatively young who really wants to help. Yeah, you gotta do this and do this. But they they, run, they want to help, but they're giving me wrong information because I go ask the, 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 the older ex-plumber get a, oh no, you don't want to do that sort of advice. And when I do research on it, same thing. Same thing with med school. There are people out there, they may even be MDs um, who they, they'll give you the wrong advice, not because they don't know anything, but uh, admissions, for example, has really evolved in the last few years. And these MDs may have gone to med school in the 90s and where it's very different, or they're not involved in admissions and they have no, no deep insight. Of course, take their advice, but just be wary of that. Okay, let's go to our own little online blog here. Um, I made these up. These are questions I got from you all, uh, prior peers on this. Uh, so that someone posted here, hey, I got a question. Am I at a disadvantage in applying to the UC San Diego School of Medicine with two years of community college on my transcript? It looks like uh, 
this other person said, yeah, totally. And the same, yours from state, don't even bother. Yep, agreed. My dentist's father's a retired obstetrician, said something like that. This other person says that they purposely screened out all applicants with community college on their transcripts before review. I can't remember I heard that though. Um, this is patently false. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, in fact, you'll be hearing from five students who are community college transfer students uh, from UCSD uh, on April 8th, I think, or maybe it's April 5th. Uh, June April 8th. What? 5th? April 8th. April 8th, yeah. So you're going to hear from five UCSD community college students. Um, we, uh, yeah, yeah. And so uh, that's patently false. The CSU states, we have even more students from the CSU system in our med school. Um, so that's a false one, okay? Oh, another one. Hey, I heard that I need to take four STEM classes a semester at community college to prove that I can handle harder material. Have you ever heard of this? And uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. That's right. Your med school, keep in mind, it's going to be STEM all the way when you land here, right? Uh, there's no uh, history class. It's going to be STEM, 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 pharmacology, anatomy, physiology, uh, just, you know, left and right, neurology, neuro, neurobehavioral health and whatnot. Um, this is false, though. Um, it's just uh, you don't. You can just take a regular thing, take organic chemistry and take history and take other stuff. You don't have to do four STEM classes a semester in mean, college to prove that you can handle harder material. You're in college, right? Um, okay, another question, very similar. I heard that if you're taking postback courses on your own outside of a program, you should take all your postback courses in the same year. Is that true? Someone writes, yeah, well, it needs a strong word, but a medical student friend of mine told me that ADCOMS, just the admissions committee, just want to make sure you can handle the load of medical school curriculum. No one writes, that's right. And they do take into account that you might be working near full-time job while trying to do something like this. Another one writes, I also heard something called a holistic admissions, where they look at everything you've had to overcome while trying to study. So asking about your post back thing the same year, um, I would say that's somewhat true. Why is that? Well, Take a look at this. Uh, which do you think is would be more meaningful to the admissions committee? Remember, the committees want to know that you can handle the rigor of an academic curriculum in med school. So which might look better? And I've seen literary transcripts where someone didn't go to a post back program and they they just signed up for a course, took one course one year, next quarter took one extra course. They had a longer course. You can see over two, three years, they're building out and they're getting all their pre-med requirements and, and they're doing okay. And of course, the more typical one I see is someone went in the post -back program and just loaded up and did this one year program and just went for it. I've also seen people do their own where they just bunch them up in a year. And just to be honest with you, the, the admissions committee wants to know if you can handle load. Um, so this would look better. If you spread it out, even though the grades are good, um, they just, and it may be that you're fine. Keep in mind, and the one on the above, you may be working full time, even two jobs, really busy, they can see that, they can see that, but it just gets a little harder to tell. And if you get an A minus in organic chemistry while holding out two jobs, raising a kid, doing what you're doing, they'll, they'll see that. Um, but it's just easier to see it if it's all in one place. Then it looks like, oh yeah, this person, look at that. You can see what they look like in a normal college kind of environment where the low is coming all at them at one time as a, like a full-time student type of thing. Okay. This person got another question. Got another question for you. I heard that STEM courses at community college don't count as much as regular UC or private college. Is that true? It's actually a real question uh, that was forwarded to me. Um, someone writes, totally true. Don't even bother taking the community college. And another person writes, I heard you get a C grade or something OCHEM. This person's kind of hmm, focusing OCHEM for some reason. Your application to med school is doomed. Um, another one writes, uh, hey, and by the way, you have to have a science major. You're not going to look as strong as UCSD as a humanities major. This is, of course, is false on, on multiple counts. So taking, well, let me be frank with you, right? Take organic chemistry. Um, <laughs> uh, organic chemistry is organic chemistry, right? A benzene ring, it's, it's going to be the same in a community college as, uh, you know, a, a four-year private college, right? Uh, you know, now there may be a variance if you're taking history. There may be, it's all about the variance and the rigor of the coursework, right? Uh, science course, this course at the community college, uh, it's still a science course, right? Um, now, OCHEM, if you get a C grade in OCHEM, your application to med school is doomed. Can I tell you a little secret? I've looked at hundreds and hundreds of, of, of uh, transcripts. C -chem, uh, OCHEM always trips people up. I have seen a few Cs in OCHEM. Your ap medical application is not doomed. It's just OCHEM. Um, and then the science major, 
but we have creative writing major, philosophy major, anthropology major, doesn't matter, uh, uh, at least the UC San Diego School of Medicine, uh, and looking at the whole package. You will have to take prerequisites to kind of round out your application, but um, you know, uh, you know, just because you're a philosophy major, one of the best students I ever saw, most prominent, was a philosophy major at UCLA, you know? Um, it just, uh, in fact, it adds some things. You add, it, you bring a uh, richness to things that uh, we still really value. Okay, uh, one more question. Um, uh, clinical activity to count when you apply to school of medicine has to be unpaid. Um, this is false. Um, so we, we got this win that if you're a nursing assistant, working next to bedside, sweating, feet hurting, taking care of patients, seeing what the doctor is doing, what the nurse is doing, that suddenly now you have to go volunteer and shadow a doctor to know what you're talking about when you want to go to medicine. Uh, no, <laughs> you know what you're talking about. You're just, you're just getting paid to do it. Uh, so that's, that's false, you know. Uh, so paid work still counts. Now, speaking of clinical activity, people always ask me, and this is a difficult question to answer, but let me, let me try and phrase it this way. Dean Galuma, is there a minimum amount of clinical activity um, that I need? and they throw out some random number of hours, and it's very hard to answer. The only true answer I can give you is that it follows this curve, this parabolic curve you see on the right there. Um, if you have no clinical activity, uh, you will not be, be accepted to UCSD, unless something weird. Now, I shouldn't say that, because the admissions committee makes the, the decision, but uh, I've seen plenty of people blocked because they had no clinical activity. It just wasn't, it, it just, it wasn't enough, you know? But the minute you start to do cl clinical activity, uh, it starts to, it's really, they're asking a simple question. Does this applicant know what they're getting into? That's all it is. And have they spent enough time doing it? You don't have to do too much before that answer, that question's answered, you know? Um, now, could I throw out a number if someone asked me uh, 200 hours? But it depends what you're doing. If, if you're just kind of, if you spent, uh, well, I'll give you an example. We had once had an applicant who was accepted to our school, whose major clinical activity was a two week mission trip she took with a surgeon. But what did she do in that mission trip? She spent two weeks nonstop operating right next to that surgeon. She was the first assist. She's sweating, her feet were sore. She spent 12 hour days and then she did post-op checks on the patients. She loved it. So she did it for two weeks straight. And that was really it because she was in a place where she couldn't get access to, to care, to, to healthcare. She was, came from one of the, uh, the uh, Pacific Islands. Uh, I can't remember which, um, but she knew what she was getting into two weeks, you know? Um, so it's really the quality more than the quantity, although you do need a certain quantity to let us know that we're comfortable. The key thing is if you have 5,000, it doesn't change the move the needle that much. We, we've, had, we've got our answer already that 300, 200 or 100, depending where you're doing, okay? Now, one thing I have to caution you, because I've seen this, and I'm going to be a little insider tips here on clinical activity you designate as clinical in your application that may be viewed with skepticism. Do not do this. If people get any idea, see, uh, admissions committee and physicians general like ethical people. The one way your application will fail immediately in med school, and I'm being absolutely here, but is if people think you're unethical. Because um, ethics cannot be fixed very easily, right? So you want to make sure you come clean. Don't fuddle, fudge, don't do anything like that. Because uh, uh, once people get wind of that, it really could throw your application off. So don't stretch things too much. So uh, we've seen someone who's volunteering at a veterinary hospital. Um, it means you're missing the point. A, a, a volunteering at a veterinary hospital uh, is community service. It's good, that's good. Put it in your application, but don't call it clinical because dogs and cats are not the same. If you're talking about starting an IV and whatnot, it's not the same as a doctor in front of a patient looking at a complex human being, having to make decisions. Maybe they're, they're conflicts of interest and that the patient wants something, the doctor needs to offer something else, or there's family dynamics, or there's healthcare system dynamics. Um, so do not put, and I've seen this literally in applications, then things didn't go quite so well. Do not put veterinary hospital volunteering. Clinical research without any patient contact. Again, some people get in front of some spreadsheet, they're doing clinical research, looking at numbers, but they never see a human being or a doctor in front of a patient. Try not to say that is clinical. Call it what it is, it's research. It's still really good, but it's research. I've had people, uh, these are actual terms, gym coach. Um, a gym coach is not, <laughs> is not clinical. Um, or someone who is a camp counselor for people with disabilities. 
Um, again, but they want to, we just want to see, does this person know what it's like to be a doctor? Have they been at the bedside? Do, do they want to be a doctor, not a camp counselor, right? So be very careful what you say, put it down for what it is. It's good employment where you're providing a service to people. You're, you're great, but don't, um, I, there should be people who put that as clinical activity. And once you do that, and, and people look at the whole rest of the application, I wonder what else they're kind of stretching here. You do not want to, to be unethical. We don't want any unethical people. Uh, in, in our school, so just uh, just be straight with people. Public health research or service without any patient contact, kind of the same with the clinical research. If you're in some office in a public health office and you're looking at spreadsheets and whatnot, but you're not at the bedside looking at a doctor taking care of a patient um, or nurse practitioner taking care of a patient, any health provider taking care of a human being at the bedside, um, it is not truly clinical. It's a lot of other good things, but be careful how you label that. So I just want to give you little insider tips um, so you don't um, look odd to admissions committees uh, when you do that. Um, oh, another question. I heard that if you haven't done any research, you have very little chance of getting into the UC San Diego School of Medicine. Is that true? And I've heard this before, multiple questions. Uh, Oh yeah, if there's no research in your file, you're dead on arrival, as they say in the ER. They, they do. Uh, they used to say they don't really say that. I, I'm an emergency physician. We don't really say dead on arrival anymore, uh, but people still use that term. I guess it's stuck, you know. Um, and another one said, um, "Oh, and I heard it has to be biomedical or bio research too. Can't be doing that engineering stuff, uh, stuff like that." Um, this is false for the most part. And I say that because why is research important? Uh, well, is that uh, you don't want to just ignore research, um, but I'll put it to this way. There are students who get into our med school here at UC San Diego without a lick of research. I saw a file just the other day, uh, no research. What that means, though, is when I talk about the servant leader and the healer and whatnot, even the innovator, this person managed to manifest herself uh, in just a different way and didn't have to get into a research lab, didn't have to do research. But uh, she still did stuff that showed she was... Uh, interested, was scholarly, and involved, uh, but it was not research. Uh, and uh, I say for the most part because they want to make sure people like students who are curious. They want that. And especially UCSD, our mission is innovative. People who are innovative can move the needle. So, but you do not have to do research to show us you're innovative. And you explore and look at look at outcomes, look at what you did and evaluate it and then adjust. And, and you're inquisitive. Um, you can even survey for process improvement uh, in, a, in an organization doing and, and just have that, that kind of process improvement driven that scholarly inquiry uh, aspect of things. Um, so false for the most part. Okay, I'll skip that. And I will um, stop there. Me too. Uh... Perfect. Um, I'll let the ladies uh, take the question. Okay, so first question. Um, someone asked, how does UC San Diego School of Medicine review MCAT retakes? Um, the, the short answer is we look, uh, you mean if you did MCAT twice? Uh, we look at what's the latest score? Oh, they did that, okay. We do not look at the fact um, they took the MCAT twice in any uh, adverse way at all. I've seen tons of applications with two MCATs in it. Uh, in fact, more often than not, to be honest with you. And uh, let's say we saw a really little MCAT the first time and an MCAT's higher. We don't say, oh, we have to average it out. We definitely don't do that. <laughs> we look at the best performance. And in fact, there, there was one time we looked at the MCAT, the first one, oh look, they got an MCAT at that and it went down. Uh, maybe it was COVID, maybe something happened. They obviously performed that level at one time. Um, and uh, so that's how we sort of view it. If I were to just pick one answer, we look at the highest score if to, to really point it out that, that way, you know. And then our next question is, what if your GPA was good, but then with COVID there was a downward trend? How would that be viewed? Um, well, it all depend what drove the downward trend, right? And so 
one thing I would advise you, if you had something to affect your GPA, put it in your personal statement um, or your autobiographical uh, thing that you see as we see your personal statement and autobiography. Um, and um, uh, just as long as people understand, we've talked in the admissions committee multiple times about why someone's grades went down. That's a very common dec decision point. It could be uh, a medical emergency in yourself, medical emergency with your family, or your parents' business failed and you had to go back and drive back and forth to help support, the, keep them under order or something like that, or a death in a family, or in COVID. And uh, for some COVID, people lost jobs and all the stress and you have to move back in. You just uh, don't, uh, it's not the COVID per se, focus on what about the COVID affected your GPA and admissions committees will definitely understand that. All right, and then someone asked, what makes UC San Diego School of Medicine unique from other medical schools? Um, boy, where do I start? You know, just a bunch of things. I think it's, the, it's the, the conglomeration of certain factors. One thing that I can definitely say, we're in a binational population. So I often tell people, you can go to visit Tijuana more easily, you can visit uh, uh, Los Angeles, right? So we have a binational population, we're on the border. We are, we're in a city with this vibrant binational population and it's diverse population, different languages, um, different uh, countries. Um, so that's that one thing. The other thing, another thing adding on to that, we're the only med school in the entire region um, which means, you, and, and we're folks in community services being built into how we educate, uh, the, you know, the entire region, uh, the entire county, essentially. Um, there's no other competing med school. Um, not that we don't like competition or other med schools, sometimes that enriches things. But what I mean by that is that uh, when someone here in San Diego says med student, they're more often not talking about a UCSD uh, medical student. Um, and then you have this very population. Um, the other thing is it's physical plant. So the, the campus, so right on campus, we're not separated from our campus like some others are. You can walk and walk to the Jacobs School of Engineering and the School of Pharmacy and the School of Public Health and walk, uh, to, you can interact and collaborate with other schools. Uh, remember innovation, right? So once you're here, we can help you with that and just easy to do, do that. Um, it just go, it goes on and on. So I would say the uniqueness is just this conglomeration of things that make it special. Earlier in the presentation, you mentioned various um, programs like University Link that UC San Diego or um, that the medical school puts on. If students are interested in those programs but live too far away, what would you suggest they do? Oh, you've stumped me. Um, I don't know if University Link has a virtual option. Um, um, you know, actually, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, there, there are programs in other parts of the state as well. So one thing you could look at is go to the California AHEC site um, um, and, and see if there are any connections there. That's one thing. Um, I, could, I could add one thing. Um, we've had almost all of your counterparts from other UCs and in all of their talks, they had uh, information that you just shared about their own program. So uh, if you are in... Northern California, you could look at the presentation by UC Davis. And if you're in the LA area, we had uh, both USC and UCLA. So, um, and then also Irvine. And so all of your counterparts have, are, that have spoken before you and, they, and then the ones after you have all mentioned these, their programs. So I would say, look at those videos that we have on our website. That is actually a, the best idea. Yeah, don't listen to me. Uh, that's a, actually even better because then you know uh, what's a tie into each med school. Yeah. Okay, and then next question. Do people reapplying to medical school have less of a chance of getting in? No, um, uh, with one caveat, right? Um, if you, when you don't get in, you look, why didn't I get in? And um, Unfortunately, admissions committees cannot tell you, right? We don't tell you why you didn't get in, even though it's heartbreaking. Uh, there's so many times I wish I can just say, hey, you know, if you just did this and this and this and this, you'd be golden, but I can't because that sets up a system where the, the applicant's response, they're really, they're just becoming, uh, they're not becoming who they are intrinsically, they're just positioning themselves for the application, right? I just give you, the tips I give you here are not, uh, it's really showing your true self, right? So people make the mistake of you know, not, not, not showing what they're about and expressing themselves. But um, 
But what I would suggest anybody does is just talk to their pre-health counselor or any mentor they may have. And can you look at my application? And be like, wait, what, is there anything I think I'd be missing? And then you'll focus on that the next time around. And that's really clear. So for example, UCSD will look at your application. Um, it's, it's each stands its own merits, but we actually see what have they done since last time? I'm curious. And then, and, and then you'll see that a lot of students have actually addressed gaps um, that, they, that were manifest in the first time around. But we do not look uh, unkindly on reapplications at all. In fact, we, we just admitted someone, we, every year we admit someone who's applied three times and that grit, that means you wanna be a doctor. Even that three times doing at it again and again, this person wants to be a doctor, that means something to us. Uh, it wasn't a casual decision and look how patient they are. They just keep trying and working at it, improving themselves year after year. That actually means a lot. And those admissions, uh, you can see a glee in admissions committee's face. They, they're very objective, right? They don't say, oh, we'll let him or her in just because they keep applying. But when they do let them in, they're really, oh my God, yay, they got in. And it's their third time. You could see a glee in the admissions committee's um, faces when they do that. You know? okay, so in our committee. So. Our next question is, could you tell us a little bit more about resources for student wellness and mental health or academic support resources at UCSD? Oh boy, I wish I had slides on that. We have a lot. Um, so let's pick academic resources. We have a dedicated office, our Office of Educational Support Services. Um, they are just dedicated to the med students. They are specialists who understand the curriculum and what they do is repackage it. They, they know studying styles, so they teach you studying techniques. They actually repackage the curriculum and present in a different way. If you're having trouble, that's the third, the second thing they do. Uh, and then we have access to teaching learning commons at UCSD, uh, where uh, you know we have a cognitive strategy specialist that we used to. She it left, and there's a new one coming on board. Um, but uh, there's that academic support as well. But the most robust is the OESS, uh, which is uh, these are people who know the curriculum inside and out. They put review sessions for students, study strategies. Uh, tutoring for students, um, and, and I'm just, just beginning, that's just the beginning of things. And then for uh, wellness, um, we have an, um, a director of wellness initiatives who spends time, has office hours for students, two, two afternoons a week. She has one afternoon a week right now, she'll be going up to two come July. Um, and um, we also have all these initiatives like peer-to-peer -peer mentorship and, um, uh, and, and wellness programming that's very comprehensive in our school. Even a wellness check-in for first-year students or things like that. Um, it was hard to put on with the, pan uh, the pandemic. So that will be switched back on now as we're getting more and more in person in there. In addition, by virtue of our medical students paying um, a tuition, they have access to UCSD, uh, psychological services, mental health services. But the nice thing about our, uh, it's called CAPS. The nice thing about our university is we have liaisons and they actually come to the med school they have office hours in the med school and it's devoted to medical students uh, because uh, it, it just to optimize and help their wellness as they go through a, what I call, I call it a radical transformation. When you go from being an undergrad to having an MD and being able to take care of people at the end of things, uh, that's a radical transformation. But it can be stressful because you're it's coming at you fast and you're, you know, what your, uh, your responsibility, what you'll get rises up pretty quickly. Uh, and so they're in the school of medicine for our students. And then finally, in terms of wellness, is our student affairs office is that is sort of their major one of the major angles they work on is wellness programming. So uh, that's more community building, uh, inter interventions that are just the right time and place for the community at large. Um, so that's all also built into how we operate as a school. All right. Someone asked, are international students eligible to apply to UCSD School of Medicine? I wish they were, but unfortunately, no. And one of our next questions is, you mentioned earlier the CAP program, the Condi Conditional Acceptance Program. Is this program via the UCSD post -back program? And could you tell us a little bit more about it and how there is conditional acceptance? Yes, uh, no, it's totally separate from the UCSD post -back program. The UCC postback program is a good program and applicants obviously applying. We know the program, we know the rigor of the program. Um, so there's that. The CAP program, the way that works is if you apply to us and you don't, um, maybe you don't get an interview or you don't get, 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 in, get on accepted. We actually reach out to you at the end of the season. Um, uh, especially we think 
God, the only reservation we had about this student was their academics. Just how could they sustain their rigor? And then so we reach out to you, interview you, and if you want, and you're accepting the program, then you join the, the CAP program. And then um, you, there's a certain set of courses that occur at UCSD, and you maintain the right GPA for acceptance. You're accepted to school of medicine because now you've removed the last reservation we had uh, about your application. So just apply and then we'll reach out to you. We will look for you. We will find you, I should put it that way. Someone asked, how do W's or dropped classes look on transcripts when applying to medical school? They, um, as you imagine, they, they have to be taken in context, right? Um, a single drop class uh, could be, like I've seen that, and what I, the way I interpret that is, they took that kind of overloaded, backed off, and set things straight. We see a whole lot of Ws, though, especially in a, in a, in a bunch together. When in one year, we wonder what happened there, um, and that's all there is. Um, if you could, if there's a reason, uh, health or otherwise, or even family situation, anything, or you felt overwhelmed, you might want to explain that. Uh, but definitely, one or one or two Ws done, to, uh, especially if we take in context of the entire transcript, does not raise huge eyebrows. And then our next question is, will the U, um, UCSD School of Medicine's interviews be virtual next cycle? Yes. We found um, it's, uh, it's so much better for applicants, so much cheaper, less stress. Well, I know, I take that back. It's probably stressful, right? But it's so much cheaper. You don't have to buy a plane ticket, hotel room, and all, all the other things that occur that, that entail the physical travel. So for the foreseeable future, we are virtual. All right, someone asked how you would go about writing your personal statement and how you can develop it over time. Yeah, so you remember what I told you about, um, well, let me backtrack even more. A personal statement packs, uh, it, it really is really great. And there are all these different personal statements, but it's all about finding out who you are as a person and why you want to do medicine, right? That's all it is, right? Why do you want to do medicine and who are you in this whole thing? And you can approach it in any one to different ways. Um, um, so since those two are the main elements, you want to really inquire, why do I really want to do medicine? Why? Um, I know it sounds simple, right? <laughs> uh, but as I told you, some people actually will write this statement because they think we just want to hear what lab they went into and how they went to this hospital and whatnot, and they miss the point. No, we actually want to find out why you want to do medicine. That's why. So you want to think about your why. Why do you want to do medicine? Um, and reflect on exposures you've had. It could be even with your own family member, but just uh, how it impacted you and, and why you want to do this. Um, and then the other thing, if you're able, is um, tell us a bit about yourself via that why. You know um, what? You know because the why it's 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 your passion, right? Uh, we want you to be passionate about why you're doing it, and your why may be different. Everybody's why is a little different. Some people like scientific inquiry. Others like helping people. Others like systems. Others just like it, it's too varied. I've I've seen many whys, and each of them is stunning in its own way. But the key thing is to focus on the why and then build from there. And then we have a question. Um, somebody is asking. Can I just make a plug on 326? Uh, we have uh, the director of UCD Prehealth Advising doing a whole workshop on personal statement. And then for our next question, um, we have somebody who's currently at a four-year university but is considering taking uh, classes at a community college over the summer. How would this be viewed by admissions? Um, uh, so I think they're saying they'll show up at a four university, but have community college classes. Oh my God. Am I detecting that someone's worried that if you have community college in their transcript, it will somehow make them look, uh, no, not at all. Uh, in fact, we like, we have 20 students. My director of admissions looked at the other day. We have 20 students with community course, uh, 20 of in our class, uh, with a community co a college courses on their transcript. Doesn't mean, uh, anything negative. That's for sure. Yeah.
Someone asked if you could share your experience in emergency medicine and why you chose that specialty. Um, well, that's pretty cool. You're asking that because uh, uh, at some point you'll have to ask the why do I want to do a specialty? So I'll tell you uh, why I like emergency medicine. It gets to why. So at first, why do I want to be a doctor? And then why do I want to do emergency medicine? It's all about the why. So your why. And so I like solving puzzles. Uh, and in emergency medicine, oftentimes you get people who come in as puzzles. They may have chest pain that is um, actually not chest pain. It's actually in their belly, right? And then uh, once you sort that out, why do they have chest pain? What's going on? And, and, and so I lo love to solve puzzles. I also like to, and, and I really like to help, to help people, but I like to help people right there in the moment. Uh, in emergency medicine, I can do that, whether it's saving a life or relieving pain. Some, usually people come to the emergency department because they're in pain. I love to relieve people's pain via a procedure I might do, or even just giving them medications. I also like to use a full breath, I like to have a holistic perspective of medicine where I'm thinking about all the things I learned in med school, whether it's the brain or lungs, the heart, and emergency medicine affords me the ability to do that. Um, I also like working with people. I like talking and joshing, going back and forth with teams and, and whatnot. And um, the, the team atmosphere in the emergency department, which is dynamic, where you're talking to people and uh, lets me do that. I also like feeling kind of in touch with the community that's outside. So for example, I can tell when there are various events showing up at San Diego in the ED because people may trip and fall or they come in with a rider problem and I can tell, oh, there's some convention or some, some uh, event going on. So it makes me, it's a vibrancy and it makes me feel in touch with my community. As I see people coming in their street clothes from wherever they are, I feel in touch with the community in that way. Um, and then, um, Lastly, um, shift work. Uh, I particularly like to be able to go to work, solve these puzzles, uh, and then when I leave, I'm done and then move on. Uh, some people don't like that. Some people like continuity where they see the same person over years and build that relationship. Um, I, I like relationships too, don't get me wrong, but I particularly like shift work a lot um, where because it's so flexible. I can adjust things around and it's a lifestyle um, choice for me. So several things, several options there, why I chose emergency medicine. It lets me apply myself as a doctor, the why I went into med school in the first place to apply it in a very specific way that, that I like to apply it. And one of our next questions is, um, the student read on the website that medical students work on a research project and they'd like to know a little bit more about when they start doing the research project and um, if they do it for all four years. Um, that might be the independent study project, uh, because that's the only thing I can think of that would be on the website. Yes, remember, we are an institution of scholarly inquiry, and so we have this thing called the independent study project that our students do, and it's not just research, it can be anything. Uh, for example, one student wanted to figure out how to use theater to promote public health messaging, and so that was his independent study project, so it could be anything. It's scholarly uh, project, and uh, and does it go all four years? It can. So some students can, can get it done within the, the summer between the first and second years. Others, they're all the way in the fourth year. And it's, it's very flexible when you apply it and when you do it. Some people actually do their project in the fourth year and finish it off. Others do it in their first year. It depends on the timing and opportunity and things like that. All right, someone asks, is a bachelor's degree required to apply to UCSD School of Medicine as long as you've done your prereqs for med school? Um, I haven't seen anybody without a bachelor's degree. <laughs> uh, yeah, I need a bachelor's degree. Um, now, could you apply without one and have enough there? Technically, I have to look at their website and see if it's a hard stop. I don't think it's expressly written as a hard stop because we just wanted flexibility. That, um, uh, um, but it's just good to get a bachelor's degree. It's a sense of closure. Now you've closed the loop on everything. And it'll help you a lot when you're applying for residency. So yeah, it just makes people, they can read your CV a lot more easily. So. And one of our next questions is, could having pass, no pass classes instead of letter grades during COVID hurt their chances? No, because we know that things were past fail during COVID. Yeah. We, in fact, take pass, no pass during COVID. That, that's an expectation on everybody's transcript. We expect that. Now, the question is, 
will you be seen as weaker, right? Because I know some colleges gave you the option. So I'll answer it very specifically. We do not say, oh, look, this person passed. Let me check it, whether it was optional. Uh, and uh, we see the, the students were given the option. They chose pass, no pa pass. Uh, we would not discount that. We would not say, oh, this student must be hiding something. That's not how we think at all. It's just a pass fail during COVID era. Um, someone asked if you had any tips for preparing for big exams like the MCAT. Oh boy, um, there are others, uh, even the whole prep things that have tips for preparing for it. The one thing I will say, I'll use the same advice I give my med students who are applying for big exams on the other end, right? So the next big exam is step one, kind of similar, high stakes, you know, huge exam. And um, first word of advice is don't be too nervous. And I know it sounds um, kind of kitschy, um, what I mean by that is the stress you induce yourself can actually affect your ability to study. The second thing is schedule things out and study so you give yourself breaks. I've seen students, even as med students, just study too hard and they get more and more inefficient as they put hours and hours in. You actually, it's an ironic thing that, oh, if I study six hours and take two one hour breaks or study eight hours, people think go study the eight hours straight and you'll do better. You'll find especially that level of performance that studying for six hours and having two one hour breaks, you'll, you'll actually be vastly improved compared to that. So I'll, uh, uh, I would recommend that. Um, yeah, just those two things uh, for now. And, and of course, speaking about taking the breaks is take care of your wellness as well. Again, advise this for our med students, exercise, be with friends, don't go into a cave to do that. Um, Cause you wanna look at your mental health and wellness while you're doing this. But being unwell can also affect your ability to synthesize new information, and retain information while you're studying for the MCAT. And the final thing I'll say, because our med students are expert at this, is generate a routine. You want to have a routine down and stick with your routine. Pick a routine that's good for you and stick with it. One of our other questions is, do you believe that volunteering in a hospital is a requirement to apply for med school? No. Uh, the single thing we ask is, um, does this applicant know what they're getting into? That's all we're asking. So, but we do, we do, uh, I will put the caveat in that question. We do, we want you at the bedside looking at patients with a doctor or a nurse practitioner taking care of patients so you know what it's like. Um, you want to see what doctors do or nurse practitioners do, or, you know, especially doctors, you know, because that's who you're, you're going to be. Um, we want, we want the, the, the key question we ask is, is um, um, do they know what they're getting into? Now, the other half of that question is, if you're volunteering, if I volunteer at a homeless shelter or at a hospital, does the hospital look better? Uh, on a, from a volunteering standpoint, no, it's you're giving yourself, uh, you're giving yourself to others, it's volunteering, it's the same thing. So the, to answer that question a different way, I'd say there's no difference there either. It's not necessary to volunteer in hospital. And this question kind of goes along with that one, but someone asked that they currently work as a community health worker and they conduct home assessment plans for patients. And they were wondering if that would count as clinical experience. Yes, yeah, so you have to be careful, right? Um, because um, um, if you're going to people's homes, you're, 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 unless you're going there with a traveling doctor who's taking blood pressures, administering medicines and doing a history and physical and actually doctoring, it may not count, uh, um, you know, yeah, so you have to be careful with that. Uh, that's all there is. Now, could you do that to round out your experience? It actually might even help you if it's a round experience. I, I shadowed or I volunteered or I went to a free clinic and then I also did this. Wow, this person has this comprehensive view now of healthcare, the spectrum of healthcare. But at the end of the day, the really admissions committees care about whether you know what it's like to be a doctor. That's really what they get. It's not that I saw it on TV, is that you personally have experience, eyes on, 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 uh, on doctors and patients. And, and that's the key thing. So if you follow that rule, is this, am I seeing what it's like to be a doctor? Is some aspect of being a doctor here? Um, you'll probably do well with them. And then we have another question. Um, they were asking, what advice would you have for somebody who has to reapply to uh, the UCSD School of Medicine? and, and their particular instance, they've had major life changes that have occurred and they had to end some of their previous activities. 
And they would they were asking if you how do you suggest explaining this on their next application? That's all the holistic uh, applications you write in your auto, for example, UCSD in auto bio or in your personal statement. You you um, you write how these changes, especially in auto bio. That's where you see the path in life, where they tripped up, what struggles they had. At least in our application, that's where people most people put it. And that's where I look. Oh, what's this person's life like? Oh, this is the struggle they had. Oh, this is when they moved over here. Oh, this is when they had to drop out of school for a year. Um, this is, um, so put it in your auto bio and that gives context to who you are as a person. And I know you've touched on this throughout your presentation, but someone else is asking how to make your application stand out from others or where are certain areas on your application that you can really stand out? make spelling mistakes and no i'm totally kidding <laughs> um there is no secret sauce to this standing out right um you know again you go back to the fundamental question will this person be a good medical student will they be a good doctor and uh, you know the standouts uh, you know certain things i can well i'll get specific in one way one one point of thing um and one thing i didn't mention about the experiences but the talk about saying i'll mention it here it's what we call the checkboxy thing. So there, I don't know how to explain it, but we can look at someone's experience and tell they're checking boxes. And the committee members say, oh, that's a checkbox. They're just checking boxes. Oh, I did my, my 200 hours of clinical. I did my research here. I, I volunteered a homeless shelter all in six month period just to get that out of the way. Uh, we can tell. So the, the, I can say how to make your application not stand out. The, the opposite of that is someone with a deep invested interest in something maybe a sustained uh, investment, some activity where they're progressing, uh, they were a member, then a leader, or they founded it or something like that. Just a, a sustained investment in something that means something to you, such that people form relationships with you. So that um, always have this rule, for example, and we see this with emergency medicine residency applications. At, at a committee, they should be able to say, oh, uh, Rachel, oh, she's the one who founded the XY. There should be something that stands out about you that's intrinsic to you, not just a bunch of check boxes all going all over the map. So think about yourself, what you're passionate about, invest in it, because um, A, it'll be easy to, because it likely it's stuff you're passionate about to begin with, uh, such that an admission committee member can even say, oh yeah, the one who, who, who's really into public health uh, and, and, and HIV, you know? That's how, and people lock into that. If you make that kind of impression where you have some sort of identity that identifies your passion, um, that may be a way to stand out. I hope that I make that understandable to you. One of our other questions is, would working as an EMT count as clinical experience? And then also, is it okay to split pre-med coursework between community college and uh, their university, which I think you did answer. Yes. Yes to both accounts. Uh, an EMT, uh, you're you're right there. If you're not giving patients to doctors, you're working alongside the doctors. Yes, especially if an EMT in an emergency department, but also picking up patients. You're some, thinking some of the same things. You're handing them off. You're giving report to physicians. You're framing your thing. Uh, it is a form of clinical experience, at least in our in our shop. You know. Someone asked about doing remote volunteer work during COVID and if that is okay at this time. Yeah, it's, it all depends what it looks like. So we've heard this virtual shadowing thing. Um, people feel this a little bit weird about it. Are you really feeling it? Uh, but yeah, um, we would say yes. Anytime you're seeing a doctor take care of a patient and you're and it may be by screen, for example, this telehealth, right? So if you could do telehealth, you can do remote volunteering and seeing a doctor talk to a patient and then moving around, looking at the blood pressure, or show me your rash. Oh, here it is, doctor. It still counts. Um, it's a little more focused, though. So you want to kind of, uh, just to be frank with you, add other things to that. Um, but I think if you're seeing what it's like to be a doctor operating in a telehealth environment, uh, that's, that's a valid clinical experience. I, I could just add one caveat, and I know that we've used them um, as being uh, contact tracers during COVID. Um, and that's a great volunteer experience, but you're not there with a the physician, but you're following up. And uh, so that's one thing that I know that's been done during the time of COVID was contact tracing. 
Yes, that's a very good point. And you know, I told you about these things that, that look clinical, but that aren't really uh, people, the contact tracing, that's a public health community service thing. Uh, when you're on the phone, hey, you know, that's not really medicine, right? Um, it is part of medicine, but it's, it, it doesn't tell you anything about what it's like to be a doctor. So that just apply that rule. Am I seeing what it's like to be a doctor? If someone were to ask me, the admissions committee would ask me, so what, what about doctrine do you learn from that? Did you see a doctor in action? that really told you what it's like to be a doctor? It could be a dermatologist, an ophthalmologist, it doesn't matter. But do you see some kind of doctor in action that told you uh, it, it's about taking care of a human being where you're the, the interaction, dialogue, and the decision-making, uh, even, as I said, the conflicts and the emotionality of it, all these things, we, that's what you will have to know what you're getting into, right? Um, uh, and uh, yes, contact tracing would not, in our book, look like clinical activity. It's very good. That's public service, uh, also really public service. It's still very good, but yeah, I would not put that in the clinical hours. And then we have one last question in the Q&A box, uh, just to follow up on the CAP program and about how many are invited per year. In our program, it's uh, about four or five. All righty, any more questions? Well, I think it's, uh, we're at 6.33, so we owe you three minutes for staying extra and answering all the questions. I don't, I don't mind it one bit, sorry. Uh, thank you again for joining us. And if some of you have questions, I put the email uh, link and the website link uh, that you could directly ask uh, the source instead of reading Reddit. And thank you again, Dr. Gulima, for your time. And um, hopefully we could have you in the future. Yes, thank you for what you're doing. And good luck, thank everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.